George Hathaway, he's a professional engineer who's lucky enough to own and operate his own lab for testing exotic claims. And if you remember, several years ago, there was a claim of a gravity shield from Podkletnov. Uh, his lab was one of the ones to put out the first peer-reviewed paper of experimental results on that, which unfortunately, it did not work. Um, but he does things like that. I asked him to come here because of the there was so much press about the EM drive and things like that. I wanted to make sure that in this context that the experimental standards of what it takes to get defensible results was at least addressed before any of that came up. So that's why he's here. Thanks, Mark. And thank you all. And thank the organizers as well as all the Tau Zero folk for uh, inviting me here and uh, listening to what can be an extremely boring presentation. Most of the stuff, or the, the guts of what I want to talk about um, that, that is most germane to what Mark was saying has to do with testing and measurement of very small thrusts and very small forces and very small energies. And those kinds of tests um, are fraught with pitfalls and difficulties and measurement concerns. And at the end of the talk, I will go quickly through that list uh, because that's probably the most boring part of the whole thing, but in fact, it's the most vital uh, for, for people who are trying to validate, uh, confirm, uh, test novel and and uh, unusual and exotic propulsion systems um, or thrust systems for, for same. Um, I would prefer also if you're taking pictures uh, of me that they don't appear on the internet. That's one of my little caveats. I, I'm one of these rare persons who want to make it really difficult for Googles and Amazons and others to locate me by my face. So if you do take pictures, go ahead and take pictures, but don't put them on the internet if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Um, as I say, uh, the thrust of the presentation is in pitfalls of measuring, uh, but before that, uh, and since it's uh, uh, moving ahead toward uh, lunchtime, uh, I will uh, uh, start with something um, more along the lines of the philosophy uh, or the art of measurement. And it just so happens that uh, a couple of days ago, a, a seminal paper on measurement techniques and especially uncertainty in measurement uh, was published in uh, Review of Scientific Instruments. And uh, I'm going to take uh, a few moments to paraphrase uh, that paper for you and, and uh, make uh, some comments uh, with regard to that paraphrasing, uh, which, is, which are relevant to the kinds of things that I've been doing. Um, as Mark say, said, I am, I guess, one of the rare uh, persons who are, are able, uh, through a long history of, um, of publishing some rather unusual uh, in, in some rather unusual areas to have attracted some funding that allows me to operate a lab independently of any institution, uh, any government agency, um, or uh, uh, any other uh, impediment to impartiality. And so I'm extremely fortunate uh, to be in that position, and I hope to be able to maintain that position. Um, our company used to be called Hathaway Consulting Services. It's now being changed to Hathaway Research, and uh, eventually you will find a website which will be coming on stream in, I hope, a couple of months. Um, so if we can, can we? Yes, we can. Uh, the publication I referred to in Review of Scientific Instruments is this one, and uh, it talks about, as I say, measurement on uncertainty in particular. Um, and I'm going to go through uh, a few of the quotes, as I mentioned, which maybe you, you might find some relevance in 
terms of the um, um, of your ability to assess the nature of measurements that need to take place when you're measuring these thrusts um, and, and forces on exotic and new inventions that come your way. So they may not come your way. They usually come to me first. <laughs> and then if I vet them, um, then, they'll, then they, they may proceed to, uh, uh, to further development. I'm the guy who usually gets the, the wacko, the really weird, the most bizarre, uh, exotic kinds of energy and propulsion um, proposals. Um, and, uh, and, and I need to know how to measure things with uh, reasonably great precision over a broad spectrum of, of possibilities. So um, we can start with, with taking a look at some of these, uh, of these quotes and see how they may uh, be relevant to the kinds of, of uh, issues that I've had to come, I've, I've come across and have been presented to me. Um, a definition of measurement and uh, which you can read yourself uh, and I, the uh, quote, the quote is there from the paper, and this is my little uh, summary of it. The talk that I'm going to present right now uh, will highlight measurement issues which factor into the evaluation of uncertainty. And of course, um, one wants to be as certain as possible about the efficacy and the validity of a new uh, force measurement uh, leading to a possible propulsion uh, system as possible before one makes a decision about which way to go. Um, properties of interest of a measurement regarding a measurement are uh, threefold. They can be either quantitative, ordinal, or qualitative, as you can read there. Uh, and the properties that are uh, of concern to the measurement of small forces and thrusts uh, and also power systems um, are typically quantitative in nature, and that's what we'll be um, um, concentrating on. Uh, okay, let's move it. And the, the results of, of measurements are not just for the uh, happiness of the of the physicist or the uh, engineer, um, they're to aid in decision making. What is it that we're going to do with the measurement? What are we going to do with this thing that we've got in front of us? We're going to make decisions as to whether we're going to make further measurements. Are we going to attract funding? Are we going to scale up? Are we going to shut the whole thing down because um, it has become completely obvious that uh, there is there's no hope for this particular um, this particular uh, object or process. So uh, decision making is the real reason we're we're making measurements and why estimates of uncertainty are so important. Continuing with the uh, with the um, quotes from this paper, uh, not only the measurement method, but also the kinds of instrumentation and the applications of correct instrumentation to the problem uh, needs to be, as they call it, fit for purpose um, and have the lowest uncertainties. And that's really rather difficult under a lot of situations, especially when you are presented, as I am, uh, with systems that are not conventional. That's why, what my job is, looking at unconventional and weird uh, situations. So I have to be prepared to be able to adapt conventional measurement techniques to rather unconventional systems. And so I have to have, and I'm fortunate to have a suite of measurement capabilities and systems that can be adapted to a large range of rather unconventional uh, approaches. Let's see. And that is basically captured in this next slide too. The choice of appropriate instrumentation 
as well as the knowledge of the characteristics of the instrumentation is vital. So uh, you would not want to uh, measure the, uh, the, uh, lumen, the luminosity of a light bulb with, let's say, a, uh, um, a resistance meter or something like that. You want to apply the correct kind of instrumentation to the job at hand whilst knowing what the characteristics of the instrument are. So you're not measuring outside the characteristics, you're applying the correct device for the job. And uh, here's an interesting quote from a chap named Bell uh, that is quoted in the paper. Um, and characterizing the uncertainty is basically uh, twofold. How big is the margin of error and how bad is the doubt about that margin? So you often hear uh, statements like, um, I am confident that uh, this measurement is uh, plus or minus, let's say, using percentage, uh, one and a half percent uh, with 95 percent confidence. So there are basically two sort of fundamental aspects of, of uh, stipulating and stating uh, a measurement um, that is relevant to what you're uh, trying to do uh, to communicate. And that's talked about here. Uh, measurement uncertainty can be calculated uh, in all sorts of ways, and you hear about them all the time, and uh, even in uh, uh, commercial uh, considerations, but uh, they have to uh, be factored into this uh, decision-making, ultimately decision-making process. And very importantly, um, measurements themselves are of fascination, I guess, to the measurer, but they have to be transferred. You have to be able to make sure that the measurements you're making are understandable and comprehensible to someone else along that decision tree. And uh, so uh, it's very important that uh, one is able to put into language that is accessible to the succeeding persons uh, or person that uh, is on the decision tree that they understand exactly what kind of measurement you're making. Especially true when dealing with rather unusual or these so-called exotic technologies when uh, a lot of folk that you might come across uh, or that come to you with crazy propulsion ideas speak in language that is not uh, understandable in particular they talk about you know various weird energy flotations or um, crystalline energy or uh, es esoteric things like etheric energy or that kind of stuff that's really difficult to um, translate into some kind of useful uh, and and understandable language and unfortunately i come across a lot of that stuff um, so Anyway, I will, I will highlight a few of the things that I've been involved with, some of which you've heard about, um, some of which you haven't, uh, and from a long list of, of um, exotic um, propulsion and, and force type experiments, um, I've called a small list here. Uh, I've been doing this, by the way, since 1979, uh, and I've seen a uh, large whack of crazy ideas, both in energy production as well as force production, um, or claimed energy and force production. Um, you've seen or you've heard uh, various discussions about or uh, mentions of Podkletnov, and I'll show you some pictures, by the way, very soon, so it'll keep you, keep you awake. Um, there's uh, uh, Roger Scheuer's uh, EM drive or M drives and Jim Woodward's Mach effect we'll, we'll talk about highlight in a sec but probably haven't heard of uh, Peter Grenot and his son Neil um, let's see if we've got a slide of 
Oh, before we do it, here's, here's what happens, or what has happened, and there's my daughter many years ago, um, getting excited about uh, uh, STEM sort of things, although she's not <laughs> involved in that at the moment. Uh, and when things get too excited <laughs> in the lab, um, things tend to collapse. <laughs> um, anyway, there's uh, Dr. Grineau there, and he is shooting water from a water arc cannon, he called it. And this device was a, uh, uh, basically a, a, a steel cylinder that had uh, water, had electrodes in the bottom, uh, very sharp, large current was passed from a capacitor bank and water shot up. He thought that, in fact, um, there was a particular explanation uh, for what he measured as being uh, an, an over-unity idea, namely the kinetic energy in the water that shot from the barrel was greater than the energy stored in the capacitors to make the charge in the first place. And he didn't understand what exactly was happening at the, uh, right down in the barrel, um, because it was obvious that, uh, you know, when you use very simple um, uh, momentum calculations and uh, that uh, it turned out that, yes, there was 10 to 1 uh, energy gain or something like that. Well, thanks to Professor Higgins, who happens to be in the audience at the moment, um, plus some experiments I did, we proved that, in fact, what was happening at the arc was completely different than what he had expected and, was the, and what he used as the basis for his calculations of overunity. The way this might have been uh, used as a propulsion system um, was pretty simple. Uh, it's the expulsion of water or other fluid uh, as your countermass, and uh, if there was an energy gain somehow, then it would have been a, a potentially useful um, propulsion system. Uh, well, that didn't work. And uh, then you noticed on the, uh, that list before, there was something called gyro, gyroscopic propulsion. Um, the, uh, we've investigated many, many uh, claims of gyroscopic propulsion uh, or force rectification. And uh, this is a, a rather substantial unit. That's about uh, an eight inch diameter, um, high speed spinning uh, forced precess precessing gyroscope and uh, it was super instrumented and, uh, with uh, uh, force gauges on the bottom and uh, all sorts of laser um, distance devices uh, checking devices and yet it was constrained to a base and there was an interaction between the gyroscope which they were hoping would show a weight loss and the floor that it was mounted on, but that didn't seem to matter them, uh, it didn't seem to bother them. We made a, a small device here which got rid of all of the junk down here and allowed us to make a free-floating, uh, unconstrained device, um, doing various tests uh, on, on, those, on that little model and um, proved uh, that uh, a simple version of the device under test could show the effect or the exp could show whether the expected effect had any validity and unfortunately it did not as I'm sure you've most of you have been thinking in your youth perhaps about wow does a gyroscope possibly give us some anomalous thrust uh, like Lathwaite and others have claimed years ago and um, as far as uh, this particular set of experiments is concerned, no. Um, Podkletnov uh, came to our lab uh, on two occasions and verified that, uh, in fact, the disks that we were making in-house would work uh, as a gravity shield in the apparatus that we had made, uh, that I had designed. And um, there's the... Uh, uh, liquid helium insert with some of the electronics beside. I'm, f I'm sorry about the quality of the pictures, but they were, they're obviously Polaroids. Um, and uh, 
There's Eugene himself right there taking a look at some early uh, experiments in the lab uh, with uh, uh, non-spinning uh, superconductors uh, and there's various other pictures uh, of, of the, uh, the setup. We, we then uh, duplicated uh, his uh, system uh, as closely as we could under his guidance and uh, got uh, null result uh, to a measurement capability 50 times better than what he had published in his 1991 paper. Uh, we published this in, about a decade later in um, uh, Physica C, and that uh, publication is available if you wish to see it. Um, and uh, a lot of people have wondered about the so-called gravity beam experiment of P Podkletnov. We are the only other group that has ever, as far as I know, um, constructed the so-called gravity beam experiment of Podkletnov, partially under his supervision as well. And uh, there's a picture of it. There's a superconductor right in there. And uh, uh, it's between uh, 600 k uh, kV. Um, Van de Graaff, so it's a, about a, a little over a megavolt uh, system, and we did not see the effect that he was claiming. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't be here. I would be uh, <laughs> yeah, consulting with some rather uh, well-heeled investors. Um, there's a, a picture of Roger Scheuer's EM drive or M drive. Uh, fraught with all sorts of uh, difficulties in measurement uh, because of offset uh, centers of gravity of various things that are like coolant is moving around and things like that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, and now um, uh, um, Sonny White and others you might have heard of have uh, uh, produced a publication that uh, uh, has gotten people rather excited and unfortunately the um, the excitement uh, may be a little premature uh, because I wrote a, an article for a Tau Zero which you may read about where I uh, claimed that uh, they were suffering from a very bad case of confirmation bias and uh, uh, that you can go into that yourself Let's see how are we doing here so um, there's uh, Jim Woodward and his device um, and his uh, Mach effect thruster. Uh, just a picture of him in his lab. The uh, point I want to make about all this is that, um, or the points that I'd like to make, um, let's see if I've got the, oh, there's our version of the Woodward, uh, Woodward uh, test chamber. This is, this is our chamber. The lessons learned from those five um, uh, examples um, are summarized here. Uh, consider, in the case of Grenot, in this case, consider all possible relevant explanations for what you see or what you measure. Uh, don't just assume that you have one uh, outstanding uh, explanation for the apparent or claimed thrust that you see. Design the simplest measurements. Remember that uh, very simple version of the uh, gyroscopic thrust uh, device um, that will validate or not the, the, the claims of the inventor and ensure sufficient information is available. For instance, in the Podkletnov case, um, we had to make a lot of assumptions because, as you, I can talk to you about that later, um, there is uh, uh, Podkletnov uh, was uh, only a small part, he said, of a much larger scheme to make his devices. He had electrical engineers and others, he said, but we could never find them. So beware of confirmation bias and concentrate on claims backed up with a reasonable theory. And that is, uh, uh, I'm putting in a plug for Jim Woodward. In fact, he has what I would consider a reasonable theory. It's not, maybe not a perfect theory, but a reasonable theory on which to base further experimentation. Uh, and now get into, in the, in the dying moments here, the actual meat of the presentation. <laughs> uh, but it is, it's so pedantic that uh, most people fall to sleep after the, f the first couple of slides. But for those engineers and physicists in the room who are beset with um, questions about the, um, 
the validity and the, um, uh, the, the, the capability of their instrumentation and, 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 and where measurement is in their decision pro making process, they have to be aware of a number of concerns. And I have created this small list of measurement concerns for your edification. Um, they are broken down into these areas and just for fun, I'm gonna go through them. There's, there's a few thermal effects that you have to wash out. There's some buoyancy concerns. There's concerns about measurements under, under uh, seismic and vibration issues. Even diurnal and gravitational forces can mess up your uh, measurement of really small forces. There's a few that typically come up in uh, even Sunny White's, in any test that you're doing in vacuum. You've got outgassing of materials, you've got slow leaks. All of these kinds of things will impact the kinds of very small force measurements that you can, can make and can count on. You have to take care of for really, really precise measurements, Coriolis type uh, forces. Um, magnetic moments, I don't know whether you can see, can't see it from there, whether it makes any difference or not, because I'm going through it so fast. Um, uh, if, we've, sorry, we've been doing a lot of work uh, in, in um, as you can imagine, with Potkletnov and other related uh, uh, cryogenic um, tests, and it's really difficult to make valid force measurements in cryogenic systems, especially when there are liquid cryogens around. So you can, you'll find all these effects and concerns about measurement in the paper that will be presented. So that's why I'm not going to um, beat on any particular ones. But I'm just showing you the magnitude of the number of concerns that you should have when you are designing a test campaign and want to make sure you have dotted all the I's and crossed the T's with regard to measurement. It keeps going and going. A lot of people don't realize how leaky, quote, Faraday cages are. Lots of couplings between electromagnetic effects and any movable masses. Grounding problems, ground loops, plague measurement systems. And uh, I mentioned a whole bunch of them there. Gradients. Pooled charges, it goes on and on. Then there, that doesn't even talk, cover instrumentation issues, uh, which are things that you have to take account of as well when you're making sure that uh, your instrumentation is correctly um, aligned with uh, what you're trying to measure. And there are signal analysis issues, and that's a very short list and the use of dummy masses and, and uh, test masses as controls have to take account of how you're doing that, how they're matched to the experiment. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge the folk who have helped me put together that list of concerns, and you can read them there. Anyway, thank you very much.